You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC-98 Paradise, the series where we take a close look at classic games for the NEC PC-98, the most popular Japanese PC series of the early 1990s. Okay, Farland 6, let's do it. This one is titled Kamigami no Isan, but is for some reason often incorrectly called Kamigami no Isen in the English-speaking world. The correct title means Inheritance or Treasures of the Gods. I'm especially excited to check this one out, cause it's one I haven't played before at all, and I've always wanted to see what lies beyond the fifth one. So let's open it up. Once again, there's a small poster. The manual is also very similar to the others in the series. And again, there's an arranged CD. Mine hasn't even been opened. I guess I'll keep it that way. This one has only five floppy disks compared to six in the previous one. This time, for a change, let's install the game using the DOS prompt. Usually, when I show my DOS screen, I'm using a popular PC98 file manager called Film TN, version 2.46, of course. I'm more used to this one than the final version. At any time, I can press Escape to exit to a standard DOS prompt. I'll insert disk A of the game in my first floppy drive. As I've mentioned in previous videos, one of the weird quirks of PC-98 is that booting from a hard drive will make your hard drives come first in the drive letter order. So right now, the two hard drives I have connected are A and B, and my first floppy drive gets the first available letter, which is C. So I go to drive C and view the contents. We can see a setup.exe, which I'll run to install the game. It looks pretty similar to the installers for the previous games, except this time they added a nice yellow progress bar. Once it's all finished, there's now a shortcut in the root directory of my hard drive A, called fsg.bat. I'll run it to start the game. G, I'm sure, stands for gods, by the way. No surprises here on the title screen, and we'll start a new game to view the opening sequence. Farland 6 takes place in a fairly modern world, with modern looking spotlights and riot gear. The propeller plane that appears in the first stage makes me think the technological progress is supposed to be about equal to the early to mid 20th century of the real world. The game also has somewhat modern looking cityscapes for the early stages, but quickly departs to the countryside for the majority of the game, so it actually ends up looking pretty similar to the previous entries in the series kind of a waste of what could have made an interesting setting for the whole thing. And I promised a modern setting in the thumbnail. Uh, now it's just clickbait. But more importantly, our main protagonist this time is a master thief named Grey, who we join as he steals a precious artifact from a museum. Grey even has an arch rival, Inspector Galvani. Ooh, Grey, I'm gonna get you one of these days. Some have said this thief-inspector rivalry feels similar to the manga and anime series Lupin the Third, but there are probably plenty of similar thief-detective rivalries in other works of fiction, too. While escaping from the museum, Grey meets two sisters who are after the same artifact he stole, known as Heaven's Gate. They are priestesses in charge of protecting the treasures of the gods, named Maecia and Alicia. That's Alicia with an E, by the way, unlike Alicia from Far Land Story 1. In the first stage, you have to move your three characters to the center of this rooftop, so that they can be picked up by this propeller plane, one by one. The plane is piloted by Gray's partner, Zero, a pistol-toting sharpshooter. At first I thought Zero was a cowboy, but seeing how he becomes a professor in the ending, I think it's likely he's supposed to look more like Indiana Jones. <laughs> The three of them escape through the city and meet up with two more of Grey and Zero's companions. There's a barbarian named Hug who can grant an extra turn to the other characters. I think it would be cute if he did this by hugging them, but instead he encourages them to make the extra turn by cheering them on. Then there's a succubus who reminds me a lot of Kite from the fourth one. They're practically the same character, but this one is named Vespa. Vespa, come to me. Daddy, is it really you? Yes, my dear. 
I guarantee it. Would I lie? In the city, the party gets kind of saved, but also kind of captured by a rich businessman named Carno. They're basically forced into agreeing to help him find all three of the treasures of the gods. These guys are obviously bad news. Hey, where's the bathroom? Cargill, show this man to our restroom facilities. Me? Why should I have... Fine, this way. Carno lends the party a guide. A hawkman named Gyario, who will become another one of our main party members. The rest of the game is mostly the party going around trying to find the treasures and preventing them from being used for nefarious purposes by Carno and other various bad guys. Along the way, we'll also be joined by a mermaid named Erp, a goddess named Lady, and a squirrel named Crook. I am not a crook. <laughs> eh? Richard Nixon. I know. So if you've been paying attention, our party now includes a cowboy slash Indiana Jones guy, a succubus, a bird, a mermaid, a goddess, and a squirrel. So like the fourth Farland story, it's crazy character time, and not many of them are meant to be taken very seriously. Still, can't top a duck with sunglasses though. At one point, there is sort of a sword in the stone scene, where only a true hero can remove this legendary sword. This isn't Ark's sword, the God Slayer, by the way. It's called the Idea Sword, and it can talk. None of the characters can remove it until we get to our main character, Gray. There's a big fake out here that makes it look like it's going to work, but he fails just like the rest. The only one left is the Squirrel, who easily pulls it out and has his class changed from Guide to Hero. And I thought the protagonist was going to be the hero. Shows what I know, the Squirrel was the real hero all along. As for changes to the gameplay, this one gives each character a special ability that they can choose to use instead of moving and attacking. For instance, Grey has a sneak ability which allows him to move past enemies undetected. The bird can carry other characters across gaps, and the goddess has a scan ability to reveal hidden items nearby. Some of these abilities actually need to be used at certain points in order to progress the game. This one also takes the area attacks from the previous game and turns them up to 11. In addition to the regular heal like in previous games, the special ability of the Priestess Sisters is an area heal, which will restore a little bit of HP to all characters nearby. Be careful though, because it can also heal enemies. Additionally, some of the equipable weapons in the game actually replace a character's regular attack with an area attack. When you attack with one of these, you get graphical effects on the map screen rather than the usual side view battle animation, and the enemies can't even counter attack. These would be awesome, except for the fact that they're bugged. After using them, the game will crash after a certain period of time. Most likely, the graphic effects eventually cause a stack overflow or some other memory related error. There's an update that will fix this, still available even today on TGL's homepage, but all the disc images for the game that you'll find floating around in the emulation world don't seem to be updated. Wow, I wish I had found the fix for that bug sooner. I spent way too much time with the game constantly crashing. I need a drink. What's on the menu this time? The only alcoholic item in Farland 6 is Brandy, which revives a character and restores some HP. Actually, I'm kind of glad this game got me to buy a bottle of brandy, since it's eggnog season anyway. The best way to make eggnog is... Wait, what was this video about again? Oh yeah, Farland Story 6. I guess it isn't over yet. So anyway, a bunch of stuff happens and we fight Funky Kong. No, wait, I'm serious. There's an enemy named Funky Kong. Wait a second, what year did this game come out in? Folks, you heard it here first. The first game to ever use the name Funky Kong was actually Donkey Kong Country. Okay, fine, let's just move on to spoilers and finish this one up. Skip to the time shown on screen if you don't want to know what happens. At one point, it's mentioned that Gray's father went missing many years ago, when he was also looking for the treasures of the gods. And one of the villains wears a mask, so you can probably guess where this is going. We fight him in one of the final stages, and when his mask is removed, of course it's Gray's dad. He says he actually died many years ago, but was brought back by Carno, using some sort of black magic that's not really explained. Since then, he's been nothing more than Carno's puppet. 
He fades out of existence, but Gray is glad that he was able to see his father one last time. In another plot thread, there's a scientist named Thorn who wants to use the treasures of the gods to open a portal to another world. We learn that the real treasures of the gods were never a couple of rocks and a statue like we were told earlier, but rather the friends we met along the way. No really, the treasures are Alicia and Maysia, who are ancient protector angels who have been reborn. Thorn is also a fallen angel from another world and has a succubus named Viper for an assistant. The two of them have made a promise to each other that they are going to travel together to the world of the gods, known as Farland. I guess that's supposed to be the world where the first five games take place. So this game apparently takes place in a completely different world. Anyway, the party defeats the succubus and the scientist and it looks like nobody's going to Farland. In the second last stage, we defeat Karno, who was actually a dragon king, and the final boss is Alicia, who is transformed fully into her angel form. So will she be returned to normal? That depends on which ending you get. At the end of stage 36, you have to have Grey choose his best girl, Alicia or Maysia. The other two choices, both or zero, are joke choices by the way, and if you choose one of them, you'll be promptly asked to just hurry up and choose one of the two girls. If you choose Alicia, you'll get the mega happy ending, where Grey successfully brings her back and you get this cool shot of all the characters for the credits. You then get the standard where are they now segment where Zero is a professor, the succubus owns an antique shop, the squirrel is busy heroing, and the mermaid is in a dolphin show. Hey, that's cruel. Is she kept in captivity with the dolphins? If you want to see the other ending without having to replay the last four stages, you can just load up a save file from stage 36 and use the debug code, which is performed the same way in every game since the third one. Then you can use the debug mode's clear command to clear the stages without having to play through them. The Maysia ending seems like it's kind of supposed to be the bad ending, but is funnier and more interesting in my opinion. In this one, they fail to save Alicia, but she promises Grey and Maysia that she'll always be with them. In their hearts, I guess, you're supposed to assume. It's a half a year later, and Grey is with Maysia, and they seem to be depressingly reminiscing, wondering how the others are doing. Then Alicia appears behind them and is like, yeah, I wonder how everyone's doing. Alicia has become a full-fledged angel, but Grey and Maysia are annoyed that she comes from the heavens to visit them every day. Then we get basically the same where are they now segment as in the other ending. But this one ends with the shot of the scientist Thorn coming to get Viper and the two of them disappearing together before rolling the credits. I guess they're going to Farland after all. In fact I've learned that these two characters also appear in the second Farland saga game, which I've hardly played. But anyway, that's the sixth Farland story game. The music this time was done by two of the composers from the previous game, plus one new guy. I was warned the music wouldn't be as good as in 5, so I was prepared for the worst. But you know what? It's not bad. It's better than 3 or 4 in my opinion. There are actually a few bangers, and the FM music really uses a lot of stereo sound in this one. Some of the sounds used are actually quite cool. But then there are a few other tracks to remind us that with FM sound, there's a fine line between sounding cool and just plain irritating. Also, the composers seem to have gotten really lazy this time. For the ending theme, they stole a track called Take My Hand from Toto's 1984 Dune soundtrack. This isn't even a case where it just sounds kind of inspired by it, it's literally the same piece of music, with no credit given to Toto. On a much lighter note, I don't think I've mentioned before that some of my favorite tracks in these games are always the shop BGMs. They're such happy little tunes with pleasant FM sounds. This is a store where they're selling brandy. What is the best kind of brandy? Please let me know in the comment section. I want to know what's the best. Yes, I will tell you the greatest brandy. My friends all know I'm a fine connoisseur. I'm gonna send you the greatest brandy. Please let me know your address now. Anyway, let's do the thing.
the last two PC-98 games were never ported to MS-DOS, though Korean fans have made language patches for the PC-98 versions, so they can still experience the 6th and 7th games in their native language. Farland Story 6, Kamigami no Isang, is the first in the series which in my opinion isn't better than the previous one. Of course though, I'm biased. But even the author of the English patch seems to generally agree with me on this one. We both found the story a little boring near the beginning, but it does kind of come around and get better somewhere toward the middle. The game also has 41 stages this time instead of 40, giving it technically the most stages yet. Luckily some of the stages this time are just quick ones mostly there for show. So overall, though it may be kind of a mixed bag, this is another decent entry in the series that you shouldn't hesitate to play if you enjoyed the others. But we're not done with Farland Story yet. Next is the last one released on the PC-98, and the only one on the system that doesn't have an English patch. So let's find out together what it's all about in the next Farland Story video. Thanks for watching this episode of PC-98 Paradise. It was supported by the folks displayed on your screen. Thanks to them, as well as viewers like you, we've managed to get this far into the Farland Story series. Let's keep it going. This has been Mr. Jakes from Basement Brothers. See you next time.